how would you, you help you with that design? How would you help with that design? You first, first, first. How would you help with that design? Well, it's a good question. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Hey there YouTube, I'm the Dapper Dinosaur. Welcome back once more to this mega catastrophe of a series. Before I get into this video too much, I want to thank Sean from the fan discord server for this amazing digital painting featuring water hoppers and a cage gill worm from the Community Speculative Evolution Project. When last we left off, Tasman Walker was complaining about the supposed decline of Christianity due to, well, basic facts of science I guess. In particular, those of geology. I don't actually see much evidence of Christianity in a decline. But that's neither here nor there. With that intro out of the way, grab yourself a beverage and or snack, and let's dive back into the stupid. Has sort of led to the, the waning of the church in the West. So sick of point. Hutton's unconformity at sick of point. So here we've got two different types of rock which meet. Uh, and uh, it's supposed to be evidence of, uh, of uh, millions of years of time, eons of time, unimaginable amounts of time. So you've got the old red sandstone on the top, the layers of rock, almost horizontal, and you've got the Caledonian strata uh, underneath where the layers of rock are sitting almost vertical. Why might this indicate an old age? Well, it takes a lot of energy to turn rocks from horizontal to vertical, and it can't be done too quickly or the rocks will fracture. Then for an unconformity to happen, those rocks have to be weathered away. Then new rocks must form on top of the old rocks. Each part of that takes time, and not a small amount of it. Uh, and, the, and James Hutton said, look, having a look at this, you know, it would have taken uh, eons of time for the strata underneath to be deposited in the oceans. Uh, and uh, uh, with the, the way the sediments are washed down the oceans in the rivers today, it would take long time to build up all those sediments. And then they were uplifted by uh, heat in the earth, uh, within the earth, uh, and then they, they were eroded down uh, and that would take eons of time for that to happen. And then you've got the old red sandstone being deposited on the top, slow and gradual. So wait, very, this, at this point here, what we're looking at is there's no, there's, no, uh, ve there's no vestige of a beginning. Hey, would you look at that? I'm a geology dummy and I got it right. And I mean that. I doubt I could even test out of an intro to geology class. I have had to look up nearly every part of this video for the first time. I had to consult with someone who actually studies geology to make sure I'm not spouting nonsense. But still, it's not hard to see why Sicker Point demands a large amount of time, and why a flood is completely inadequate to explain it. There's no sign of an end. And so Hutton came up, he sort of really was a Hindu idea, of cycles and cycles and cycles on the earth, and he really imagined an eternal earth, which of course has been totally contradicted by the the uh, first and second laws of thermodynamics. A few things. Not seeing an evident beginning for the Earth is not the same as thinking the Earth was eternal. Hutton's idea bears only vague and superficial similarities to the Hindu concept of the eternal cycle of Brahma's dreaming states, which bring about universe after universe. Also, make sure that if you're playing creationist bingo, you put an X in the box for a second law of thermodynamics. So when we go to seek a point, here's a little picture of it. You can see the, the grey layers on the bottom sitting vertically. And you see the cracks running along. Can you see that? Uh, and then you can see the red layers. There's just little segments of them sitting on the top. And, and of course, when at Hutton's time, they didn't, he, he didn't even know. He says, no powers would be employed except what we know. Hutton says, hey, let's not just make stuff up. And I guess that makes him the bad guy. What should we do? Just make stuff up until it fits our a priori notions derived from one particular and fringe interpretation of a book? Because otherwise we might get scared about the nature of existence? Yeah, I guess you could go with that. Or you could go with actual science and find oil. Because, spoiler alert, when Zion Oil and Gas decided to use the Bible to find oil, it failed miserably. And so what did he know? He imagined that the, the sedimentary layers were deposited just like rain. Uh, can you see the little dots there? And so the, the, this sediment's going into the ocean and it's raining down onto the bottom, just uh, dropping down slowly and gradually, building up the different layers. And so that's what he imagined was happening. And so, uh, and because of that imagination, he got the idea of, of eons of time. Except that's not imagination. That's an absurd phenomenon that occurs all over the world. You can't just say that a regularly observed process which results in the observed rocks 
didn't make the rocks unless you can show why it didn't and what could have caused it instead. And no, magical flood isn't an explanation. You know, but you know, in 1929 there was a uh, an earthquake, and the Grand Banks on the continental shelf uh, in North America, uh, I think it was up there, and uh, and what happened was part of the continental shelf has suffered an underwater avalanche, and uh, you can see there this underwater avalanche. Can you see it? It's a brown rocks there, and the part of the continental shelf fell away, and it slid right across the bottom of the ocean basin, ocean floor, uh, and it, um, it, it, it came across as um, uh, sediment and mud and sand mixed in with water. So it was heavy and it slid across just like uh, uh, 100, at 100 kilometers an hour. And they call it a, a turbidite or a turbulence uh, flow. Uh, and so these turbidites, it actually, as it, sh it went across the ocean floor, uh, the, this uh, tur turbulent flow intersected a number of telephone cables going across the ocean and uh, it br they were broken and the time that they were broken was recorded and when this was later analysed, some people put, to get, put two and two together and came to the conclusion that it was this underwater avalanche which had, had broken these cables and came up with the idea of turbulent flow, turbidites. And uh, as I say, up to 100 kilometers an hour. And so... Yes, turbidites are deposited quickly, and during what can reasonably be called catastrophic events. But they show evidence of being turbidites, such as graded bedding, ripple marks, ripple laminations, etc. Geologists can check to see if a sediment is a turbidite, and guess what? Most strata aren't. So unless you've got a citation that says all the layers you're talking about fit the criteria for turbidites, then there's no point in bringing them up here. So this, this is the first chink in the armor of uniformitarianism. Sure, whatever. Geology isn't strictly uniformitarian. Uh, is that these things, 100 kilometers an hour is not slow and gradual, and turbidity current deposits, and so the idea is you get this, this uh, uh, water that's full of this sediment, uh, the sand and mud, running across the ocean floor, and when it settles down, and uh, it doesn't take long to settle down, You've got sandstone, which is poorly sorted because it's been carried along and hasn't had time to sort into the different sizes. And then you have mudstone sitting on the top of it. Okay, but what about when there's shale on top of that, and then another turbidite deposit, and then uniform sandstone, and then chalk? That's the kind of thing that we see all over the geological record, and no single flood can explain it. And floods can't even explain the shale, uniform sandstone, or the chalk at all. The ability of a flood to deposit rocks is not a matter of contention. Uh, but, and also it's discovered that these, tur these uh, turbulent flows, they can have multiple ones happening all at the same time, one after the other after the other, running across the ocean floor. And so one after the other, these things form uh, the, the, the deposits. Did we get that there? Did you see that go across? There we go, one, and there's another one there. Uh, and they just continue to build up. And you find these, tur these turbulent deposits the, uh, 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 right around the world. They're very, very common. Yep, no one is contesting that. It's the fact that that's not all we see. We see other things which cannot be explained by a flood that presents the problem for young Earth creationism. And as geologists sometimes say, they're very, very boring because it's just all the same. And so that's what we see in the um, Sicker Point. We see them sitting on the end. So they've been deposited horizontally and then later they've been tipped, it on their, tipped on their end and then shaved off. And so the, the very turbulent deposits that are there indicate that it was deposited rapidly. So much for Hutton's idea that it was an icon of slow and gradual, a rapid deposition. Okay, so let's dig into the actual geology of Sicker Point and see if a single flood can easily account for it. Now, the subvertical dark strata are greywack, which is in fact a kind of turbidite and mostly found in the Paleozoic. So there is in fact at least the possibility of these strata having been formed in a series of catastrophes in quick succession. However, these strata were subsequently uplifted more or less intact to their present nearly vertical position, something that is not done quickly. Then there is the basal conglomerate on top, which is also likely a turbidite. But interestingly, most of the large chunks of rock in this conglomerate are actually from the underlying greywack. So the greywack had to have lithified and uplifted before whatever flood or landslide deposited the conglomerate. 
So this could not have been part of the same event, because there would need to have been time for the Greywack to lithify, be uplifted, and eroded before the conglomerate can be laid down. Then above the conglomerate is the red mudstone. This stone could not be laid down in a flood, and there are several layers of it. So after the conglomerate was deposited and turned to stone, then several layers of fine-grained sediment, which takes a long time to deposit and lithify, were laid down on top. It's really not hard to see why this would indicate to Hutton that a long time had to pass for this to form. It certainly did not occur in a single year, all under a single flood. And then at the contact between the overlying um, uh, red, uh, old red sandstone and the, uh, vertical, the, the vertical underlying turbidite deposits, if they'd been sitting there and, weather, and just weathering in the weather for a long period of time, weathering down, then you would expect the, the hard layers to stick up high and the soft layers, like the mud parts, to weather down low. So you'd have uneven contact between, uh, at that point. But in actual fact, when you look at the... You, you, would, you actually see that the soft and hard strata are cut evenly indicating that it wasn't slow and gradual weathering, but that it was a rapid process. The period over which erosion occurs has little to do with how even it will be. Let's assume that the erosional forces acting at Sigur Point that wore down the Silurian Greywalk did so more or less with equal force across the extent of the surface. Now, no matter how strong those forces were, the harder layers would be less eroded than the softer layers. So flat erosion is more of a mark that the Greywalk does not vary significantly in hardness, not that the erosion was rapid. In fact, we even saw that way back when, when we were looking at outflow channels on Mars. The harder areas, such as the areas where meteor impacts had hardened the rock, were able to resist weathering from a flood that on a geological timescale was more or less instantaneous, and not slow and gradual. This resulted in uneven erosion, despite the erosion event barely taking any time at all. And so you can see uh, uh, there's a uh, picture of the contact between the... Um Caledonian strata underneath and the old red sandstone at the top indicating that it formed rapidly. And also in the top layer what we find is there's broken rock in, that, in the layer that's sitting on top of the strata indicating a, a, a rapid flow that's been ripping up the material and depositing in the bot layer. A breccia layer which means broken rock, it can be angular, also there's some rounded parts and some quite large in that layer, indicating this, uh, the, that the process over the top was also rapid. Yep, after the slow uplift and erosion, a subsequent event deposited a conglomerate relatively rapidly after scouring away some of the grey whack. Uh, and when you look at the old red sandstone in the area, you can see that it's got some thick layers of strata, uh, which is sand which is deposited, indicating that it was uh, large water flows, and you can see the cross beds uh, uh, that that this uh, girl is pointing to the layers which are on an angle between, uh, through the strata and, and again indicating water flow and you can actually see what direction that it was flowing in. Yes, those layers of sandstone were indeed deposited by water, but not flood water. In fact, they can't have been deposited by flood waters because they have none of the hallmarks of having been so deposited and are instead completely consistent with slow deposition under a steady flow of water for a long time. And also in the area, you can see some of this sandstone uh, uh, stuff that's standing up. And you can see a man standing alongside. It's quite a large exposure. You can see that some of the strata have been um, distorted. Soft sediment deformation, indicating that the sand was deposited and then some sort of maybe earth movements have caused this deformation. So you get a lot of sand deposited all at once and it's disturbed before it has a chance to, to solidify and, and to become really hard. Uh, no. <laughs> Uplift of unlithified sediment would result in the sediments mixing and becoming a single layer. It is a strange creationist myth that rock cannot be uplifted or folded after it hardens, when in fact, if it is to preserve the layers, this is the only time it can be uplifted or folded. It turns out that under intense pressure and heat, rock can plastically deform to an incredible amount. In fact, this can and does occur to fossil-bearing rocks, in which the fossil bones of even large animals, like beefy ankylosaurs, can be plastically deformed, warping out of shape without breaking. And so this icon of many ages, which is taught in, um, in, in geology, and many geologists and students are taken over there on field trips, 
is actually an icon of catastrophe. Yeah, basically it's an icon of both the need to recognize catastrophic events and the long ages involved in geology, because both are needed to explain Sicker Point. And we can put it on our little diagram here, uh, uh, Sicker Point, Scotland. We can show that this is where the turbidites were deposited as the floodwaters were rising, and this is where the uplift occurred that tipped up the, 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 those deposits, and then they were shaved off, and then the overlying old red sandstone was deposited on the top. So how, during a flood that's depositing grey whack, did it lithify in less than a year, and what about the flood uplifted it? See, this doesn't work as an explanation. At best, you could explain the oldest layers in a worldwide flood if all you're looking at is Sicker Point. But all the rock after that certainly can't be part of the same event. But I think that's where we're going to leave Tasman Walker for today. After this, we're going to go get into more specific formations in places like North America and back in Australia. But for now, I'm going to leave you. I hope you liked this video. If you did, please hit the like button and leave a comment telling me what you liked about it. If you hated it, hit the dislike button and tell me why you didn't like it. Either way, please subscribe if you haven't already. And if you have subscribed but have not hit the bell for notifications, please do that so you're always notified when there's new Dapper Dino content. I'm the Dapper Dinosaur. Thanks for watching, but before you go, I'd like to thank my patrons, especially my $20 and above patrons Van Toven, Ian Chen, Speed of Sound, Chris Love, Henry Hutanen, and Bob Knob. My patrons help me keep this channel going because, as you may know, YouTube is a very volatile platform. If you'd like to help out, my patron tiers start at only $1 a month, and it automatically gets you access to the exclusive patron only Discord server, as well as early access to my videos and voting for what next topic should be. For example, my patrons tend to be the ones who decide which episodes of Things That Aren't Dinosaurs I'm going to do as well as sometimes who I'm going to cover next in the next debunking series. If you feel like a monthly donation isn't right for you, but you'd still like to support the channel, remember, every like and share and comment helps the channel. But if you'd like to help in a more material way, I do have a wish list for Amazon.com and a Teespring store. Links in the description. Thanks for watching. Well, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know.